Good morning. Are there any who has not yet written the name to me, this uh, list of participants? If someone has not yet written, please do it. I want to collect everyone's name <laughs> once. So I go to the part two of the material of the book, bioelectric sources and conductors and their modeling. I start with the volume source and volume conductor. Last time I just a few minutes was speaking about this topic, but only short time, so I will start from the beginning of chapter 7. The concepts of volume source and volume conductor are essential in bioelectromagnetism. In traditional uh, electronics, in electronic circuits, the components are concentrated, and between them are wires as connectors or conductors. So we have a resistance, we have a battery, we have a capacitance, we have a inductance, and they are connected with wires, and it is considered that the electric property of this component is concentrated on that point. In bioelectromagnetism, situation is very different. The source, in this case the heart, is distributed in three dimensions, so it has a volume. The conductor, the body, is uh, also three-dimensional volume conductor, and what is essential is that the measurement distance, the distance from where it is measured, this source, is short compared to the source dimensions. Therefore, in bioelectromagnetism, the source is a volume source, it is in three dimensions, and the conductor is a volume conductor in three dimensions. And this is the reason why we need special methods for solving the problems in bioelectromagnetism, and I will teach those to you a bit later. In this material, in the book, and on these lectures, I use the concept of preconditions, and I briefly say what I mean with them. It is this kind of box indicating what is the source, for instance, volume source, what is the conductor, for instance, infinite homogeneous conductor, and in addition, if it is not specially said, it is also assumed that the conductor is linear. Linear means that Ohm's law is valid with all values of current, and that it is isotropic, the resistivity is same in all directions. Are these true? Well, the linearity is surprisingly well true uh, in the region what we are interested in. But isotropicity is seldom true in the living tissue, very seldom, and it is discussed separately. But in this theory, it is, if it is not otherwise expressed, it is assumed that the uh, conductor is isotropic. And when preconditions are given, they are valid until new preconditions are introduced. Bioelectric source and its electric field. I start with a volume source in an infinite homogeneous volume conductor. So preconditions are simply source is a volume source and conductor is infinite and homogeneous. Do there exist infinite homogeneous volume conductors in, in uh, uh, real nature? Well, in the bioelectric problems there do not exist such, but we can assume or speculate that if we place the, the person in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and make the measurements on the, uh, on the Scottish and, and American coasts, then it is quite close to the infinite homogeneous volume conductor, but that is a theoretical speculation. 
So, the reason why I speak first about infinite homogeneous volume conductor is that the problem is simplified. I introduced to you the bioelectric source, which is the source of this course. This is the main, main uh, role, main person, main character of all this uh, uh, story, the impressed current density. And it is so simple. Ji, it represents, represents the transform of chemical energy to electric current. It is the source, which is function of the location x, y, and z, and function of time. Then it is in con this connection given an uh, equation describing the total current density. J equals to Ji plus sigma E. In the literature you always find this equation first. And if I don't explain what it means, it may sound a bit uh, strange. So I tell you what it simply means. Impressed current density is the source which is either depolarizing or repolarizing cell. And impressed current density exists, therefore, only there where the cells are either depolarizing or repolarizing. In this case, in this uh, situation in the heart, the depolarization is proceeding here, and it is a surface, and that is the only region where, where Ji does exist. Due to Ji, there exists the return current, only therefore, the return current, and it exists everywhere in the volume conductor. Literally everywhere, of course, mostly concentrated somewhere around the source, close to the source, but literally everywhere. It is sigma E. So the total current density is sum of impressed current density and return current, Ji plus sigma E. And then I mentioned the quasi-static conditions. And as I said last time, if I, would, if I had not introduced you to quasi-static conditions, I'm sure that no one of you had asked me that, please tell me are the conditions quasi-static or not. No, it is uh, considered self-evident in bioelectric uh, problems, but it is worth of noting that bioelectric problems really obey quasi-static conditions. Therefore, that in the volume conductor formed by the human body, in the frequency band of bioelectric sources, the capacitive component is negligible, the medium is only resistive, currents are conduction currents, and electromagnetic propagation effect may be neglected. Therefore, all currents and fields behave as if they were stationary. It means that situation is the same as if the source had had its value, at its present value, forever. It is stationary. So there is no phase shift in, in, the, in the phenomena. Since E is quasi-static, it is negative gradient of the scalar potential phi. And it may be written that J equals to Ji plus uh, minus sigma nabla phi. Or the same equation in this form, Ji equals to sigma nabla phi plus J. Since tissue capacitance is negligible, the divergence of J is zero. And this equation reduces to Poisson equation. We multiply it with nabla. Nabla dot j i plus nabla dot sigma nabla phi plus nabla dot j equals, because this is zero, nabla, uh, sigma nabla square phi. Equation 7.3 is a partial differential equation which is satisfied by phi and in which nabla dot j i is source function. The solution for this scalar function for scalar function sigma 
phi is, it is a general solution in theory of electromagnetism. I refer to the old standard reference Stratton for historical reasons, but there are several more modern books of the electromagnetic theory. And the solution is this equation 7.4. There minus nabla dot ji is defined as flow source density. Flow source density, uh, therefore, that uh, I later on introduce the uh, vortex source density. Solution outside the source region, what we are interested in, not inside the source, but outside the source region, is this can be formed, uh, uh, rewritten in the form 4 pi sigma phi equals to integral v j i nabla dot nabla 1 over r d v. This is the electric field due to the distribution of impressed current density j i. And where? In infinite homogeneous volume conductor. So it is a simplified, simplified situation, simplified uh, solution. But the bioelectric problems are not in infinite homogeneous volume source conductors. Therefore, I give you the solution in an inhomogeneous volume conductor, which is the real case. So preconditions are source is a volume source, as before, but in this time the conductor is inhomogeneous. Is it finite or infinite? This is just a speculation. We can say that the human body is uh, infinite inhomogeneous volume conductor where the conductivity is zero outside the surface. Well, this is speculation. Usually it is of course said that it is finite inhomogeneous volume conductor. Anyhow, how to handle the inhomogeneous volume conductor? It is uh, modeled by a piecewise homogeneous volume conductor. A conductor which is composed from homogeneous regions. Such a piecewise homogeneous volume conductor has the following uh, boundary conditions. Phi prime S sub J equals to phi double prime times S sub J and Sigma prime sub j nabla phi prime s sub j dot n sub j equals to sigma double prime sub j nabla phi double prime s sub j dot n sub j. So these are the boundary conditions. What do they mean? They look uh, on the first side, look a bit strange, but very simple thing. I, I teach you what they are. Very simple issues. So the piecewise volume, or piecewise homogeneous volume conductor means, as I said, that we divide the volume conductor with uh, bounding surfaces to different regions, and each region is homogeneous. For instance, in the human body, in the thorax, for instance, one region is, for instance, the lungs. Another region is the heart. Third region may be uh, the, uh, the, the bones. One region may be the muscles. One region may be fat, and so on. So we assume that each of these regions are homogeneous, and we build up the volume conductor from these homogeneous regions, which have different conductivities. The boundary conditions are simple. The first boundary condition, it means that the potential phi, where prime means on one side of the boundary and double prime at the same location on the other side of the boundary, 
are the same, of course, because the boundary is not any isolating, uh, uh, isolating foil, isolating surface. It is a mathematica mathematical uh, uh, boundary. Uh, of course, the potential must be the same on both sides of this boundary, which is separating the regions. That's simple. And the other boundary condition <coughs> means that uh, the normal component of the current is the same on both sides of the boundary. When the con there is a difference in conductivity, uh, the current is flowing here and it is uh, uh, bending on the boundary because of the different conductivities. But the normal component must be the same on both sides because there is no source or sink on the boundary. That is the second boundary condition. Then I give you the Green's theorem. How many of you have heard about Green's theorem? Has anyone? Huh. Usually someone has heard about it, but uh, no one knows what it means. I tell you, Green's theorem, as you see, I, I enjoy reading the equations. Sigma j integral s sub j, sigma prime sub j, psi prime nabla phi prime minus phi prime nabla psi prime, minus sigma double prime sub j, psi double prime nabla phi double prime, minus phi double prime, nabla psi double prime, dot ds sub j equals to sigma j integral v sub j, psi nabla dot sigma sub j, nabla phi minus phi nabla dot sigma sub j, nabla psi times d v sub j. What does it do? <laughs> It's a strange equation. Well, it uh, changes the surface integrals to volume integrals or vice versa, the volume integrals to surface integrals. That is what Green's theorem does. It's a very general theorem, not specially dedicated to bioelectromagnetism. It was derived by George, George Green, uh, who was living in Nottingham, England in 1700, 1800. He was a miller. He had a windmill. And there's a placket in the building where he, uh, on the wall of the building where he was uh, uh, living. And you may see that on the top of the placket there's a windmill. So he was uh, milling, uh, uh, milling uh, uh, flowers and uh, he had a good time to think and he was thinking about uh, Green's theorem and published that uh, in, the, in the Royal Society in, in England and became famous. So that is a very fundamental theory. Now let's use this theory. We insert that Psi is 1 over R and Phi is electric potential. And then we derive a few steps. I don't uh, spend too much time on that. You can find from the book and so on. I give you the result. I think you are more happy then. The result is this. Electric potential in inhomogeneous volume conductor. And this is uh, derived by David Gezelovitz, who is a very famous a theoretician in bioelectromagnetism. And this equation, as it is written, describes electric potential in inhomogeneous volume conductor, which is the real case what we are working with. So what is the equation? It shows that the electric potential 4 pi sigma phi r function of r is integral volume integral j i dot nabla 1 over r dv plus sigma j 
integral s sub j surface integral sigma double prime sub j minus sigma prime sub j times phi nabla 1 over r dot d s sub j that is that's something which we have to love this is the our problem in, in bioelectromagnetism. But to be able to love this, we have to know it better. And uh, what does it mean? Let's return back a little bit. Let's see what I told you just before. What was the electric potential in homogeneous volume conductor? Homogeneous volume conductor where the uh, conductivity sigma is the same on both sides of every boundary. It was this equation which I gave you just a second, a minute ago. And now if you return back here, you find that in this equation for electric potential in inhomogeneous volume conductor, the beginning is the same as for homogeneous volume conductor. The first term is exactly the same. Then we have the second term. What is here? Here are the conductivities on both sides of boundary J. J is the index. It is made an integral, surface integral, calculated for this term. And this is done for every surface and the big sigma means that these are summed up, counted together. So now it is not anymore so very difficult. What you find here is that the first term is the potential due to the source. This is the beef. This is the due to the source. That's what we want to know. The second term is a correction term which indicates what kind of contribution or actually what kind of error to the signal is produced by the inhomogeneities in the body. We are not interested, of course we may be interested, but in general when doing bioelectric measurements, we are not interested in the errors we are interested in the field of the source to be able to calculate the source. So these are errors due to the inhomogeneities. And if you think here that if on some surface J the conductivities are the same on both sides in this way, this term is zero, it means that all this integral for that surface is zero. And you can see that if it is a homogeneous volume conductor, that's the same for every surface, and this term disappears totally and comes to this equation. That is not difficult, but it, it, it's easy to understand this. I tell you one issue which I personally do not like. In the literature, it is also said that uh, called that these are secondary sources which exist on the boundary surfaces which cause the error source. I don't like the issue of secondary, secondary source because they are no sources. There are no primary or secondary sources on those surfaces. So this is the effect of the inhomogeneities which causes an, uh, an error to the real signal. When we design bioelectric measurement systems, ECG systems, EEG systems, whichever systems, when we design them and we want to get as good uh, information, poor and, and, and noiseless and source errorless information from the source, then we try to design the lead system so that this term, the second term, 
here is as small as possible hopefully doesn't exist at all because the first term is that what we want to see that is the story I proceed to the concept of modeling I ask you what is a dipole Any idea? What is a dipole? I'm sure you have heard about dipole. What is a dipole? Now you are afraid, <laughs> very afraid. Please tell me. No, you are not brave enough. <laughs> okay, this is a trick. This is a trick. It is not what you think. No, it is not what you think. What you think is that it is... Uh, pair of positive and negative charges or positive and negative source no that is not the dipole that is a doublet it is a dipole or it will become a dipole when the source and sink approach infinitely close and their magnitude increases so that the moment stays constant then it is a dipole, which can be described with a vector. So a dipole does not have a, a physical dimension. It has the electric property. I found from the internet this beautiful animation. It shows how a dipole changes a doublet. Now it is a dipole, and now it is a doublet. And you find that close to the source dub, uh, dub, doublet uh, dipole, the field changes a lot, but further away, of course not. That's very, very nice, very nice uh, animation. <coughs> what kind of models we may have for the volume source? Firstly, why do we need models? We need models, therefore, that we may simplify the problem. Make, uh, to make the life more simple. What kind of models we may have for the volume source? The most simple one is dipole. Dipole which has a fixed location and which has a free direction and free magnitude. I should ask how many independent variables it has, but it is already said down there that it has three independent variables. But what other variables? What do you need to know about the dipole to be able to know the dipole? So there are three something it is said here. Well, it depends on your coordinate system. If you use the Cartesian coordinate system, they are the x, y, and z components of the dipole. If you use the spherical coordinate systems, they are the two angles and the magnitude. But important is that the dipole has three variables or three components. The second model is a moving dipole. It is a dipole whose location is changing, and we find out also the location. How many variables it has, it is simple. It has three variables for the dipole and another three variables for the location. Multiple dipole. This looks very fine. It is a model where the volume source is divided to regions. In this case, the ventricular muscle and each region is represented by its own dipole. It is a multiple dipole. If the number of dipoles is n and each has three components, then it has three n variables but usually when using this model it is simplified so that its di the direction of the dipoles is fixed 
because the, it is known that uh, uh, the depolarization proceeds in the certain direction, then the number of variables is n. It's very it sounds very physiological and, and uh, illustrative model. And then a model one model is multipole. Please try to uh, differentiate with these two words, multiple dipole and a multipole. They sound very much the same, and I bet that uh, I mix them during my lecture too many times. So please be careful to uh, to, to uh, recognize which one is in question. Multipole. What is a multipole? It is a higher order multipole expansion of a volume source whose mathematically whose components are uh, dipole, quadrupole, octopole and so on. They continue to infinity, coming more and more uh, uh, complicated. It is illustrated like this, which is misleading. So the components here, here are the dipolar components, three dipolar components. They are not doublets, but they are illustrated like doublets to be and to understand that uh, they are in that orientation, but they should be dipolar components. I show you a more detailed picture of this. The whole multipole expansion, it starts from a monopole. Then come the three dipolar components quadrupolar components which may be uh, thought that uh, they are composed from two dipolar components each octopole components or terms which may be thought that they are composed from quadrupolar components so this is a certain mathematical structure and what is fundamentally important here that each element is independent which means that no element is a linear combination of the other elements this is mathematically very important it it, it has a big role in 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 the solution of the of, of the, the volume source problem so they are independent components and as i said it Mathematically, it continues forever uh, uh, to the infinity, more and more and more complicated terms, and all of them are independent. I take a summary of the source and conductor models. Simple summary. Source models first, uh, dipole, it has three variables, independent variables, moving dipole, six, multiple dipole has n components, theoretically three n, but as I said, if the direct orientation is fixed. And multiple has the dipole, quadrupole and octopole terms and so on and so on. The conductor models, infinite homogeneous, that is the trivial case does not consider the volume conductor's electric properties or its boundary with air. It's a simplified situation. Finite homogeneous models. The first is the spherical. It's another trivial case in the case that the source is a dipole and it is in the center of the sphere. If it is so, on the center of the sphere, the field, what it generates on the surface of the sphere, has the same distribution as if we would observe the situation in infinite homogeneous volume conductor. Except that its magnitude is three times larger, but the distribution is the same. So therefore it is... a. Uh, uh, trivial case. Finite homogeneous uh, volume conductor with realistic shape. 
It considers the shape of the outer boundary of the thorax in, in cardiology, but no internal inhomogeneities. And finally, finite inhomogeneous volume conductor. It considers the outer boundary of the thorax in cardiology and internal inhomogeneities. Of course, the same, same uh, business with, with, uh, uh, with EEG modeling with the head. So the finite inhomogeneous is, the, of course, the most accurate and depending how accurately it is modeled, the volume conductor. What kind of volume conductor the human body is? Here is a quite simple illustration on the cross section of the thorax on the level of the heart. It is illustrated uh, the heart, heart muscle and the uh, atria and ventricles with the blood lungs, there's aorta, esophagus, and then there are the, the bones, the spine, uh, xiphoid, and ribs, and then there are muscles, and fat, and skin, and of course here are the lungs. What are the electric properties? Uh, it's given this kind of numbers. The resistivity for the blood is 1.6 ohmmeters. For the heart muscle, 2.5 ohmmeters parallel to the muscle fibers and 5.6 normal to the muscle fibers. So you see that the heart muscle is not isotropic. It has one to two the resistivity ratio between in the direction and normal to the muscle fibers. Skeletal muscles have still stronger uh, anisotropicity, 1.9 parallel, 13.2 normal. Lungs have about 20 ohmmeters, fat 25 and bone 177. At this moment I warn you, I tell you that any values of the resistivity, which you find from any uh, reference, any source, anywhere, or which you measure anywhere, any value is wrong. Every value is wrong. So these are about values. So it is very, very difficult or impossible to get accurate values. So therefore, that firstly, they change very much. I show you a picture very soon. They, they change very much as a function of time, as a function of location, and from individual to individual, and so on. So there is no single value for any tissue resistivity. But these are just illustrative. Why there is so accurate number as 177 for the bone, I tell you in a minute. Here is an example. Resistivity of blood, it is a very strong function of hematocrit. What is hematocrit? Hematocrit means the percentage value of the red blood cells in the total blood. That is not constant. It changes. But here are two mathematical equations and models. Maxwell-Fricke model and the exponential model, which show as a function of hematocrit, the resistivity quite close, the, they have the same uh, values. The hematocrit, normal hematocrit values for male vary between 40.7 to 50.3 and female 36.1 to 44.3. So that is the normal value scale for male hematocrit. So this is hematocrit and you find that the resistivity already varies so much within normal men. 
Normal female have this variation. So now you again find what is the range for normal population, male and female patients or subjects. Wide range. And that is the normal. And then there are sick people. Anemia means that the uh, amount or volume of red blood cells is lower than normal. Resistivity comes smaller. And polycythemia is a disease where the uh, uh, hematocrit is higher and then of course the resistivity is higher. With this single slide I did demonstrate that do not believe any single value of hematocrit. Of course it is possible to measure from this patient at this time from this location the resistivity the hemato of the blood. But in general to say that uh, the resistivity of the human blood is so and so it's nonsense. It changes in the, in the range. This is uh, traditional or, or, or uh, much, very much used model for the human head. It was introduced by Rush and Riscoll in the very uh, important seminal paper describing the, 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 the lead fields for electroencephalography. They used this kind of concentric model of three spheres for the head. So that the region of brain had radius 8 centimeters, upper surface of skull 8.5, and outer surface of scalp 9.2. And they assu assumed that the resistivity of skull is 80 times, 80 times the resistivity of scalp and brain. Scalp and brain had the same resistivity. So, if taking uh, 2.22 ohm centimeter for scalp and brain, it gives 177 for skull. This model was used uh, from uh, 1969 over 30 years in all publications concerning about the measurement of EEG uh, lead fields. The same model. Until in the beginning of the of 2000, so I have the publications I, I show you later on, 2002, 2004, something like that, Austin Dorp and Hauskamp and so on, made an excellent study about the resistivity of the skull now I warn you, they were of course not able to give a single number, but gave a, a about number, a range where it is, and found that this resistivity ratio, 80, which was used for 30 years by all the scientists in the world, is nonsense. The correct, there is no correct ratio of course, but it is something, something about 10, maybe 15, maybe less than 10, but about that range. So it is very much different from 80. Uh, I do not blame Russian Riscoll. I don't want to blame these famous scientists, even though they have made a mistake. And the reason is that it is not the f main purpose of the publication of Russian Riscoll to find out what is the resistivity of the skull. No, it was the purpose to formulate the derived the equation for calculating the uh, uh, lead fields, whichever is the resistivity ratios. So it was a seminal paper. Is a spherical model for the head, is it a good or not? Well, when first introducing it, everyone is smiling a little bit because it is considered a little bit uh, uh, strange that uh, the person would have a fully spherical head, which is of course not true. But there is an excellent reason to use a spherical model. And that is that because of the great symmetry in this model, the equations for the electric fields and the lead fields and so on, can be expressed in closed form. They do not need to be iterative 
calculations. And that is fundamentally important. So it is useful, mathematically extremely useful. How well it fits to the real case, especially after correcting the resistivity values. Here you see how much it differs from, from a real skull. And you can also see here that regionally it is not so bad. If we fit it like that to the frontal region of the skull, parietal region of the skull, or occipital region of the skull, then it fits well. But it does not fit well to the whole head. It is a good model. It is a good model, but today the calculation with the computers and with the iterative Feynman models and whichever models is so much more powerful that the spherical model is not so much used anymore. But it's, it's important anyhow. I skip that. Here is some table about the resistivity values for various tissues, references given there, and uh, some remarks. I do not go through all these. Maybe I go something through. For instance, for brain, you find already that there are different values for gray matter, matter white matter, and an average. Cerebral spinal fluid must be considered. Blood, 1.6. No, no, only 1.6. I just told you that it is something else. But that is with hematocrit 45. Plasma, heart muscle, anisotropic. Skeletal muscle, anisotropic. Liver, lung, fat, bone, and bone, longitudinal, circumferential, radial, and bone has several different regions. The cortical bone, it doesn't mean the head, but cortical bone means the surface of the bone. It has a higher resistivity because it is uh, more solid, and inner side of the bone is porous, and, and it's uh, very different. If there is some liquid inside, then it, you know, it, as it is, it makes resistivity lower. So this is just an overview. You may find various uh, uh, sources from the internet. This is one famous calculated by Gabriel, given large number of values. But how real they are, I'm happy to say that they are not correct, but they are close to the correct. I proceed to the forward and inverse problem. Well, in this institute, you are doing a lot of inverse problem with electrical impedance tomography, but I assume that not all of you are within those projects, so I will introduce to you the forward and inverse problem in a rather simple way. Let's have the source, in this case the heart, the volume conductor, the thorax, and the recorded ECG, the field. If we know the source and we know the conductor, we may calculate the field, and this is called the forward problem. If we record the field and we know the conductor and we want to calculate the source, that is called inverse problem. How easy it is to calculate the inverse problem, I tell you in a minute. The problem is that the inverse problem does not have a unique solution. There is infinite number of solutions which fit the field and conductor values. But you do not know which one of those does exist in your case. And that is a problem. I demonstrate this. Let us model the volume conductor, like for instance the thorax, with very, very simply with two resistors. That is the volume conductor. It was Edward Lowry Norton who introduced this speculation. Let us place a source, which is 6 volts there, and measure what is the voltage between the measurement points. It is two volts. Let us insert a three volts battery to that location. Again, we can measure two volts from the measurement points. 
Let us place a 2 volts battery there. Again, we may measure 2 volts. And that can be modeled with the uh, uh, source and impedance like that. So you find that this simple problem had three different solutions. And when making the measurement just outside, you do not know which of those is in question. That is the something which makes the uh, inverse problems interesting because it is not possible to solve them. Well, I, I heard that there was sometimes uh, was it in 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 the Hewlett Packard company when they were recruiting new workers. There was a question in the test that how can you differentiate with these three possible solutions, which is in question. If we have three boxes here, one of each, how can you find which one is which? Black boxes. Are you able to get the job in Hewlett and Packard? Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't hire you. <laughs> give, you give me a better solution. <laughs> yes. I'm not sure if that helps. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Any other suggestions? Yes, please. And measure what? No, the current the current is the same. The current is the same in 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 each case. It is the same in each case. Well, there is a possibility. You just let them be for a while. And then you measure the temperature of these three boxes. And you find that in, in, in A, the, the, there is more current flowing inside and it's warmer. But that's, that, that's not the theoretical solution. <laughs> you may also measure the magnetic field around because it, the current is generating magnetic field. Maybe Edward Lowry Norton didn't like this answer. There are possible approaches to the solution of inverse problem. This is very primitive. It's sad to show this slide in this institute where the inverse problems are solved in electrical impedance tomography. Much more the fascinating way, more complicated. But this is just to help you to proceed to this problem. Firstly, what is the clinical problem? Is it the forward problem or inverse problem? It is, of course, the inverse problem because the doctor in cardiology, the doctor is measuring the ECG and from the recorded ECG, he tries to find out what kind of source the heart has. So it is the inverse problem, which is a clinical problem. So the one approach is the empirical approach. I call this phone book method. If you want to call your friend, you take a phone book and find there is the name of your friend and there is a phone number. So that's how you find it. The cardiolo cardiologist also similarly uh, uh, knows that here are the uh, uh, list of different ECG signals and here is the list of diseases. So by experience, he knows that this kind of ECG is connected to this kind of disease. That is the empirical approach. Lead field theoretical approach, which means that when knowing the distribution of sensitivity, measurement sensitivity of the lead, the source most probably exists there where the measurement sensitivity is the strongest or best, because the signal most probably comes from there. Not accurate, but way of thinking. Modeling method, which I show you on the next slide. And imposition of physiological constraints, which means that uh, we know something about the physiology of the problem. When recording ECG, we know that the heart is, yes, it is in the, in the thorax, it's there. We know that the heart has two atria and two chambers and so on. From those 
uh, prerequisites, we know quite a lot about the source, and that helps in solving the problem. But let's see about the modeling method. How the, how the way of thinking goes in the modeling method? We construct a model for the source. The model should have a limited number of variables. This is important. Limited number of variables. Then a model is constructed for the volume conductor. And the accuracy of the conductor model must be as good as or better than that of the source model. Then we do at least as many independent measurements as the source model has independent variables. Now we have as many equations as we have independent variables, and from algebra you know that we can find the calculate the source, source model. So what was wrong? I just said that it is not possible to solve the inverse problem, but I just now solved it. Because now we have a new question, namely, how well does the constructed model represent its physiological counterpart. So we did not solve the heart. We solved the model of the heart, simplified model for the heart. And is that simplified model well representing the heart? Yes, if it is, then we have actually solved the heart somehow. But actually we didn't solve the heart as a source, we did solve its model. So this is how it goes. So you find that inverse problem is not possible to solve. But how do the cardiologists then are able to do the cardiac diagnosis? Well, they, the first issue is that they do not know that it is not possible to solve. And therefore, they are able to solve it. It is uh, mainly based on the experience. Well, it's called a story that there was a mathematician who, a competent mathematician who calculated that the, the honeybee has so small wings that it is not able to fly. But the honeybee doesn't know that and therefore it's flying. Here is an important way approaching this issue, which is that if the solution of the inverse problem is limited somehow. If it is limited to a dipole, it's very simple. But it may be limited to a surface. So large model may be. It may be limited to the surface. And if it is limited to a surface, then it may be solved. That's the best which can be, do accurate, can be done accurately. This is the limit. It's a seminal paper, so Yamashita and Yamashita and Takahashi in 1982 and 1984, who published this. This is the important issue. So, I repeat, if you are studying the volume source of the heart, from the surface measurements on, on the thorax, you are not able to get a unique solution for the inverse problem, which means that you are not able to solve the inverse problem. No, you are not able. But if you limit the solution that you calculate only, what is the epicardial potential? For instance, take the whichever surface, but it is natural, take the outer surface of the heart. You want to calculate that what is the potential distribution on the surface of the heart which generates this field on the thorax surface. That is possible to solve if you limit the solution to a surface. Similarly, in the brain problems, if you limit the inverse solution to some surface, which is naturally the surface of the brain, the cortex, it don't necessarily need to be that, but that is natural solution. If you limit to the cortex, you are able from the measurements of potentials, potential field on the surface of the scalp to calculate accurate, unique solution for the electric field distribution on the cortex. 
That is, that is the best what you can do. That is the best what you can do. You cannot do more. This is what you can do. This is important way to think to issue to remember. I skip chapters 8, 9, and 10. Uh, I could speak something about electronic neural models very, very briefly, but I, I do not want to spend too much time on that. I just tell you that the material in the book is uh, quite old, showing transistor models for the neurons. Nowadays, they are done with computer modeling. But the, the, in principle, the material is okay, but it is old-fashioned at the moment. The source field models is an interesting chapter. It was written mainly by, uh, or actually only by, uh, Robert Plonzi. I, uh, I could lecture it also, but I just take some, uh, uh, save some time. I, I go directly to theoretical methods. Theoretical methods in bioelectromagnetism. Theoretical methods for analyzing volume sources and volume conductors. I start with a solid angle theorem. What is a solid angle? It's a bit strange word in this connection, but that's what it is. What is a solid angle? Well, the angle Angle is this, that is an angle. But what is a solid angle? Solid angle means three-dimensional angle, three-dimensional angle. The word solid, in, 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 for instance, in Finnish language, we use literally, we speak about space angle. That's something which describes it. I don't understand in English why it is said solid angle. I feel the solid is, for instance, this floor is very solid. But uh, I don't understand solid as, as, a, as a space word, but that's, that's what it is. Raumwinkel in German. So it is space. It's correct. But anyhow, please know the word solid angle in English, and that's it. No complaint. I start with solid angle theorem, which was uh, worked much by Hermann von Helmholtz happy to say it here. Uh, source is, in general, inhomogeneous double layer. Conductor is infinite homogeneous. Well, somehow it is a bit too much to speculate, but I may speculate that finite inhomogeneous may be somehow used, but that may be useless to say because it's complicated. Infinite homogeneous conductor is clear. Solid angle. So solid angle is the surface area of the unit sphere. It's seen from the negative side, from the center of the unit sphere. Unit sphere has a unit radius. So uh, that is the solid angle which is uh, positive. It is seen from the negative side. The dimension for a solid angle is Omega, which is uh, called, its symbol is omega, it's called steradian, and its dimension is square meter over square meter, so it is dimensionless. What is a double layer? It is, I could say that it is extended dipole, it is a dipole extended to a surface. So if we have a here, on the surface, we have uh, uh, current sources and current sinks, so that there is a certain source density on the surface and sink density on the surface. These are showing electric wires which bring electricity to the black balls, which are the sources, and so on. If I first show these two surfaces, the source surface and the sink surface as separate surfaces. Distance d, they have the moment p. And the resistance across the sheet for a unit cross-sectional area is r equals to uh, sigma d. 
voltage across the sheet is J rho D. And by definition, the double layer forms a dipole moment per unit surface area. That is definition, P equals to J D. And these two, this forms a real double layer, of course, then when the source and sink densities increase to infinity and approach infinity close so that the moment stays constant. The same story as in, in dipole. Since P is P, N is the dipole moment per unit area, P dS is an elementary dipole. Its field given by the equation 8.2 is d phi equals to P over 4 pi sigma double 1 over r dot dS. The solid angle d omega as defined by Stratton, I again refer to Stratton, is minus d omega is nabla 1 over r dot dS. And finally, the inhomogeneous double layer generates potential phi, which is 1 over 4 pi sigma surface integral p times minus d, d omega. So, it is uh, infinite double layer and inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous in case, this case meaning that its moment is not constant throughout the surface, uh, but it is changing, that is inhomogeneous. And then there is a very unfortunate minus sign, it is something which I do not like at all. The potential is positive on the positive side of the double layer, but the minus comes from the definition of the solid angle, because it is seen from the center of the unit sphere. So this is complicated speculation with the, with, with the polarities, which I do not like at all. The inhomogeneous double layer is not so interesting to us. It's a bit complicated and cumbersome problem. So let's, let's make life simple and speak about uniform or homogeneous double layer. Homogeneous double layer means that the potential, the moment of the double layer stays constant throughout the double layer. The other term, word which is used for this is uniform. Homogeneous and uniform mean exactly the same. In the case of uniform double layer, this equation of inhomogeneous double layer simplifies because the P has a constant value, the moment is constant, the potential is 1 over 4 pi sigma P minus omega. I do not like the minus. This has something very interesting consequences and applications in bioelectromagnetism. First I show this that despite of the minus sign, on the positive side of the double layer, this is the double layer, on the positive side the potential is positive, on the negative side in the space the potential is negative. And the equation means that when you find a location in the space where you see the double layer in a solid angle omega, it generates a certain potential phi. When you go to another location where it is seen in the same solid angle, as large solid angle, the potential in that place is then also the same phi. So those points from where the double layer is seen in the same solid angle, they are on the surface which is an isopotential surface. This holds only for the homogeneous double layer. Here is an interesting consequence, which is that a closed uniform double layer generates zero field. Here I use as an example an ellipsoidal double layer, but it is closed. It doesn't have the rim. It is closed surface. Let's observe that from one point 
and it is seen in the certain solid angle omega. You just look it to the outer contour, and it generates a potential phi sub c. Now, let us cut this double layer along this contour, just taking the scissors and cut it to two halves, two parts. This is one part. It is seen from the negative side, from the inside, it is negative inside. A solid angle is positive, but it is negative from inside. And this part is seen from the positive side, but both of these parts are seen exactly in the same solid angle. So the potentials phi 1 and phi 2 must be equal but opposite in polarity. That means that they cancel each other and closed uniform double layer generates zero field. I take some other examples. Let us have this kind of closed double layer. It is intentionally drawn in the form of cardiac ventricular uh, muscle. It has a ventricular muscle form and it is covered with a disc, which makes this closed. So it is closed on the sides and the cover, disc cover. Because it is closed double layer, you see how it, I can show you, please look how like the cover is raising up. Inside is a negative potential. You may guess how much I enjoyed drawing these illustrations. <laughs> it generates zero field because it is closed double layer. Open double layer. Let's now take the cover out and turn it upside down. I claim that both of those, the ventricular muscle and the cover, they generate exactly the same field because when the cover was there, it was compensating it to the zero field. It may be shown, which I do not do here, it may be shown that this kind of spherical disk is a very dipolar source, so it can be represented with the equivalent dipole. And of course, if that is an equivalent dipole, that is also. Now comes a surprising consequence. Assume that we have three different alternatives, not at the same time, but that we have uh, this kind of double layer connected to the cover, this kind of double layer connected to the cover, or this kind of double layer connected to the cover. One at a time, not, not uh, simultaneously. All of those double layers, the fields which they generate, may be compensated to zero with the cover because it makes them uh, closed double layers. So, this disk cover has the same, generates the same field as any of these examples here. So, what is strange here is that when you consider these three examples of the double layers, they, all of them generate the same field and you find that the field what they generate does not depend from the form of the double layer at all. It depends only on the rim or the opening of the double layer. That sounds strange, but that, that is, when thinking through it, is, it is simple. It is the rim of the homogeneous double layer which solely describes the field. Let's take still one example. If the double layer has two openings, 
the first one, this we take the cover off, and another one here. This opening may be represented with this disc, which is this dipole. This small opening may be represented with this disc, which is this dipole. This has uh, some very strange consequence. If you have a look to the basic electric ideology textbooks, you find that the effect of an old myocardial ischemia to an ECG may be modeled with an active source in the region of the infarctive region and pointing inwards. That's what the textbook says. I bet that there is no clinical cardiologist who understands why it is like that. I claim so. Now you are able to understand it. Because this comes from the double layer theory, from the uh, solid angle theorem and the double layers. Physiologically, it is not possible to understand why an effect of the dead tissue can be modeled with an active source pointing inwards. It sounds very, very strange. But when you go backwards here, you recognize that this here, this opening, describes the electric activity of the heart, the, the ventricular muscle, and this opening corresponding to this disc represents the effect of the infarcted area, the dead tissue in the ventricular muscle. So that is the case. It is coming from, from a, a solid angle theorem. I do not discuss miller gezelovic model. If there's nothing wrong in the model, but I just skip it. I go to lead vector. This is quite fundamental concept in this course. And I, I start discussing it now and I uh, still continue it next time. Lead vector concept was introduced by Hermann Carolus Burger in 1946. He was a Dutch scientist. Preconditions for lead vector are source is a dipole in a fixed location and conductor is finite, inhomogeneous, finite or infinite, inhomogeneous. So it is uh, very general. It, the, the, there is no uh, limitations for the conductor. It uh, utilizes or uses two laws. One is linearity, which was uh, uh, formulated by George Simon Ohm, the Ohm's law, and superposition, which was formulated by our good friend Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz. Superposition is very self-evident nowadays, but it was not self-evident before Helmholtz. Nothing new under the sun. Uh, George Simon Ohm was not the first to describe Ohm's law. It was Henry Cavendish, 1781, who described it first. But George Simon Ohm has the honor to give his name to this law. Now is following something very simple. Sometimes I, I think that why, why do I describe it in so detailed? Because when speaking so long time about so simple issue, someone may think that it must be very complicated. But no, it is not. It is, it is too simple. Too good to be true. Too simple. Ohm's law means something very simple. Let's have it in as a one dimensional problem. Let's think about calibration. We have this kind of circuit. There's a current source J. 
its magnitude is unit current, one ampere. It, in this case, it generates to the this point a voltage which is 0 0.02 volt, which we may measure. If we place instead here a current source which is 5 amperes, then the voltage here is five times the previous voltage. It is 0 0.1 volts. So this is linearity. Very simple thing. Now we may write this relationship in a general form. U is C times J and C is 0 0.02 volts per ampere, which is 0 0.02 ohms. That is the Ohm's law. Every student of electrical engineering knows and understands this very basic. There's nothing strange here. It is just simplicity. What is lead vector? Lead vector is the Ohm's law in three dimensions. Linearity means that each three components of the lead vector tell what potential is generated to the measurement point due to each three components of the source dipole. And superposition, the total potential in the measurement point is the sum of the potentials due to all the three source components. This is the lead vector. So the trick, the idea in the concept of lead vector is that it is Ohm's law, but it is Ohm's law in three dimensions. And why do we need a three-dimensional Ohm's law? Of course, therefore, that we have uh, volume sources and volume conductors. We are, we, uh, we s extend our way of thinking from a one-dimensional problem, three-dimensional problem. That is bioelectromagnetism. Therefore, we need the lead vector. It, I, I agree that it sounds first a bit strange to speak and to think about three-dimensional Ohm's law. Uh, it takes a certain time before your brains are shifted to the three-dimensional uh, mode. But when, when you get that, it doesn't take too long. When you get that, then you have learned a lot and your eyes open to understand the, the bioelectric problems. So that's, that's, that's important. I show you another example from the same issue or, or tell the story in the same way. This is in the book. Linearity. Let us place a unit current source to the source point Q in the volume conductor in the direction of X axis. The unit current source is I. It generates to the measurement point phi, the potential which is Cx. If we place here an other source, which is Px time i, then the potential due to linearity here is, of course, Px time the previous potential. Ohm's law in one dimension, no problem. We repeat this way of thinking in direction of y-axis. Unit current source J generates potential C sub y. Py times J generates a potential which is Cy Py. Very simple. And same in the z direction, I just give it down here. So we observe in the three cases separately here. Because of linearity in each case, phi is linearly proportional to the dipole magnitude. That is the linearity. Superposition. Let us place an arbitrary source dipole P here to the source point. The source dipole has Three is composed from three orthogonal components. 
Pxi, Pyj, and Pzk. That is the source. It generates a potential phi, which is the sum of the potentials generated by the x component, y component, and z component. We do the superposition. Very simple. We may define a vector. Let's make a practical this issue. We define a vector C, which is Cxi plus Cyj plus Czk. Mathematically, the potential phi is the scalar product of the dipole P and the lead vector C. If we form this kind of equation, C dot P, when you calculate it out, you get this equation. That is vector algebra. So the P is, uh, it can also, the dot product may be calculated geometrically like that. Because of superposition, phi is proportional to the sum of the potentials of each dipole component. The proportionally coefficient is three-dimensional. It is the lead vector C. It is this one. That is the lead vector. So, if we know the lead vector, the proportionality coefficient, then when placing here any kind of source P, we get the potential here, but just by doing the dot product lead vector times the source vector is the potential. So this is Ohm's law in three dimensions. This is a good time to go to the Mensa to digest food and digest lead vector. Thank you very much.